Welcome to your AP Statistics, Chapter 15, Video 1. Probability Rules When two events are disjoint, we can use the addition rule for disjoint events from Chapter 14, which is the probability that A or B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B. So remember, that means if A and B are disjoint, they are mutually exclusive. A and B have nothing in common. So you can just do the probability of A plus the probability of B because they never occur at the same time. However, when our events are not disjoint, when they can occur at the same time, this earlier addition rule will double count the probability of both A and B occurring. Because so when you do the probability of A, it'll be included, and when you do the probability of B, it will be included. So you've added the overlap twice. Thus, we need the general addition rule. Let's look at a picture. Okay, so for any two events, if you look at that Venn diagram there, A and B, since there's overlap, there's that little area A and B. Well, when we add the probability of A, we include A and B. Likewise, when we add the probability of B, we also include that A and B. So that overlap region gets added in twice, so we need to subtract it off once so that it is included only one time. So the general addition rule is for any two events, A and B, the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Why do we need to subtract that off? Again, it's because that overlapped region has been added in twice. Back in chapter three, we looked at contingency tables and talked about conditional distributions. When we want the probability of an event from a conditional distribution, we write probability of B and then like part of an absolute value symbol A and pronounce it the probability of B given A. So we're saying what's the probability of B occurring given that A has already occurred? Okay, we know A has occurred, now what's the probability of B? A probability that takes into account a given condition is called a conditional probability. To find the probability of the event B given the event A, we restrict our attention to the outcomes in A. We then find the fraction of those outcomes B that also occurred. So the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A and B, both occurring, divided by the probability of A. Note, the probability of A cannot equal zero since we know that A has occurred. So we don't have to worry about that. Okay, so we've looked at the general um, addition rule. Now let's look at the general multiplication rule. When two events, A and B, are independent, we can use the multiplication rule for independent events from Chapter 14. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. However, when our events are not independent, this earlier multiplication rule does not work. Thus, we need the general multiplication rule. We encountered the general multiplication rule in the form of conditional probability. Rearranging the equation in the definition for conditional probability, we get the general multiplication rule. For any two events, A and B, the probability of A and B equals the probability of A times the probability of B given A, or the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of B times the probability of A given B. Independence of two events means that the outcome of one event does not influence the probability of the other event from of occurring. With our new notation for conditional probabilities, we can now formalize this definition. Events A and B are independent whenever the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B. So what that tells you is that knowing that A occurs doesn't change the probability that B occurs. It's the same. Um, your probability of B occurring in general is the same as the probability of B occurring given that we know A has already occurred. That is what independence means. Equivalently, events A and B are independent whenever the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A. Disjoint events cannot be independent. 
unless they unless the two events are impossible. If the events occur, they cannot uh, they cannot be both disjoint and independent. Well, why not? Since we know that disjoint events have no outcomes in common, knowing that one occurs means the other didn't. So that totally changes the what we know about one the second event. Thus, the probability of the second occurring changed based on our knowledge that the first occurred. It follows then that the two events are not independent. A common error is to treat disjoint events as if they were independent and apply the multiplication rule for independent events. Don't make that mistake. It's much easier to think about independent events than to deal with conditional probabilities. It seems that most people's natural intuition for probabilities breaks down when it comes to conditional probabilities. Don't fall into this trap. Whenever you see probabilities multiplied together, stop and ask whether you, whether you think they are really independent. Sampling without replacement means that once one individual is drawn, it doesn't go back into the pool. We often sample without replacement, which doesn't matter too much when we are dealing with a large population. However, when drawing from a small population, we need to take note and adjust probabilities accordingly. Drawing without replacement is just another instance of working with conditional probabilities. So for instance, like if you're playing a card game and you've got a deck of cards, um, as you deal somebody's hand, you are not sampling with replacement. They don't look at the card and they just put it back into the pile. They hold on to those cards. So while you're doing that, the probabilities of say getting a club or a heart or a red or a three, any of those things that's changing with each card that's given out because because those cards are meaningful. They are, they belong to one group or the other. And so the, the, the probabilities are adjusting constantly. A tree diagram helps us think through conditional probabilities by showing sequences of events as paths that look like branches of a tree. Making a tree diagram for situations with conditional probabilities is consistent with our make a picture mantra. Figure 15.5 is a nice example of a tree diagram and shows how we multiply the probabilities of the branches together. As you go along a branch, you multiply the probabilities. In other words, so if we want to know the probability that a student is a binge drinker and has an accident, you multiply the 0.44 times the 0.17 and you get 0 0.075. And that works because that probability there for accident being 0.17 that is the conditional probability. That is the probability that a student has an accident given that they are a binge drinker. Okay, so we can multiply down the branches. All the final outcomes are disjoint and must add up to one. So if you look out to the far right, all those probabilities, if you add them up, you get one. We can find the final probabilities to find probabilities of compound events. So like I said, if you want to find, you know, the combination probabilities, the and probabilities, you can look at the probabilities at the end of each branch. Reversing the conditioning of two events is rarely intuitive. Suppose, suppose we want to know that the probability of A given B, and we only know, or we know only, um, probability of A, probability of B, and probability of B given A. Well, we also know probability of A and B, since probability of A and B is probability of A times the probability of B given A, so that's just one little calculation away. So from this information, we can find the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. Okay, when we reverse the probability from the conditioning, conditional probability that you're originally given, you're actually using Bayes' rule. Now, I'm going to talk you through using the tree diagrams where you don't have to memorize this, but it certainly works. The probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A given B times probability of B. That's just using what we know in order to find the, the probability of A and B. And then we're going to divide by the probability of B, and the way that we do that is we do, um, or rather the probability of A, excuse me, the way that we do that is we do the probability of A given B times the probability of B plus the probability of A complement given B complement times the probability of B complement. Okay, right, so what can go wrong? Don't use a simple probability rule where a general rule is appropriate. 
Don't assume that two events are independent or disjoint without checking that they actually are. Don't find probabilities for samples drawn without replacement as if they had been drawn with replacement. Don't reverse conditioning naively. And I'm going to, again, we're going to look at an example in the next video, and I'm actually going to show you how to use the tree diagram to do it. Don't confuse disjoint and independent. Okay, so uh, we, we learned the probability rules from Chapter 14 are for special cases when it comes to adding and multiplying. Now we know how to do that in general, and we've talked about reversing the conditioning. Um, we've looked at Venn diagrams, tables, tree diagrams throughout our entire discussion of probability and they help us organize our thinking and we know uh, more about independence a sound understanding of independence will be very important throughout the rest of the course all right so we're going to end the first video here and we will come back and look at examples